Let me run the disclosure right now. Hi, I'm Mark Himmelstein. I'm the I think we might have just lost the audio of the video. You're not hearing the audio? Yeah, I only heard the first few words and then it just stopped. Interesting. Let's see if we can. Hi, I'm Mark Himmelstein. I'm the CTO for Risk 5 International, and these are the disclosures. Only Risk 5 members may attend. Um, this is in order to protect our IP um, uh, rights. Uh, we have an agreement when we become a member. Uh, it's important that anybody who goes ahead and joins a meeting uh, includes their name of their affiliation, their company, or if they're an individual, say individual, uh, or an institution. Uh, so everybody knows where everybody comes from. We have an antitrust policy. We abide by the regulations in the United States and other countries. Uh, there is a link at the bottom so you can check that out. We are a collaborative and welcome community. There's a code of conduct. If there are any issues, please contact uh, as, as specified in that code of conduct website page or send mail to help at um, But we're intending to be more than just uh, uh, not, you know, violating code of conduct. We want people to feel welcome. We want to feel that, have them feel included and uh, have them feel like they can share their ideas and not feel threatened in any way, shape or form. We do have meeting conventions. Uh, we start our meetings for one hour at five after. Um, we tend to try to not a rat, rat hole. If there is a topic, then we either handle it in email or schedule all time to do that. Um, and you know, we worry about people's uh, time zones and other things. So we try to make uh, meeting times. Obviously, there's a lot of competition for 7 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, and we try to accommodate as much as we can. So uh, welcome to the meeting. And uh, hopefully, uh, if there are any questions, uh, we can get them answered. Uh, you can always send mail to help org. And thank you very much. So. I think we are getting ready to start here. So, so hello everyone and welcome to another Risk Five technical session. Uh, today, uh, it's an interesting talk. I'd say uh, it's you're going to learn or going to understand the, what's happening in this bootload and firmware and everything else that goes up in the, with the operating system. So we have Daniel here. Daniel is a, I mean, one of the, let's say one of the few individuals that I really, uh, that really like this kind of uh, low level development and that uh, I have been working with others on this firmware and, and boot world for a while. And I mean, he's the one that really likes and enjoy uh, sharing his ideas and sharing his experience with these activities. So, Daniel, uh, uh, so folks, throughout the presentation, you are allowed to ask questions. So Daniel is going to try to answer them, but feel free to type that in the chat if you are not comfortable uh, asking the question. So uh, you are all muted, muted, and if you need to talk, just raise your virtual hand and I'm going to allow you to talk. So Daniel, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, I see there is already a first uh, question in the chat. Um, maybe that's actually useful for you, Rafael. Someone is asking when oh, yeah. uh, the recordings will be uploaded. I try to publish that 24, uh, at least 24 hours from, from now. But I'm going to share uh, as soon as we are done I'm, and the, the record is available, I'm going to send an email to all members with the location from where you can get the slides and the recording. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, with that, let's start. So um, the topic I'm presenting today is actually something very, very large. And I try to, um, you know, uh, 
get this down into some chunks that uh, should be, I think, easy to understand. Um, I will go a bit into details on the agenda later. Uh, so yeah, the title, I, I will just repeat it as it is. It's bootloaders in limbo. It's between platform initialization and operating systems. And I want to stress this because bootloaders, they can grow and extend to various sizes. And we're going to look at, well, how we can actually still tame them in a way so you know that they don't get out of hand. So, but first, yeah, let me also uh, quickly introduce myself. Uh, so I have a bunch of different backgrounds myself. Um, my actual field of study was IT security. I, at some point I switched to computer science and now I'm actively working as a software engineer in my day job. I'm mostly working on the web today, less on infrastructure, uh, but I'm also doing applications, especially user interfaces, and I've done a bunch of commerce. Now on the um, open source side, there is actually uh, one thing I at some point ran into and uh, you know that made me very enthusiastic about everything, hardware and low level development. A friend of mine introduced me to it and he founded the open source firmware conference at some point. So yeah, we're going to have one again uh, this year. You are very welcome to check it out. Uh, it's osfc.io, that's the website. And there will be even more and more talks on this stuff. Anyway, I also sometimes work on operating systems a bit. If you do firmware, then, well, it's it's a bit natural that, you know, you also need to understand this overlap in a way. And at the same time, also software distributions, like, you know, everything running on top of operating systems or distributing operating systems, that kind of stuff. And occasionally I need to, you know, reverse engineer things a bit, get an understanding. So, and as Raphael said, I'm uh, one of the individual members in ROS5. I'm not even sure exactly when I joined, but I think it was like one and a half years ago, maybe. And well, uh, that also uh, made me even more curious about hardware because there is a board program that we currently have where you can also sign up, uh, you can participate and also get a development board to develop a certain project. So yeah, I also did that. Uh, that is uh, why I got uh, one of the boards uh, we will be talking a bit about later on. And so here is the agenda for today. I uh, split this into three sections, actually. In the first section, I will talk a bit about, well, this is sort of uh, the sales part. I will talk about business, right? So bootloaders, I think, are very, very essential to your business. If not, they are, in fact, defining your business later on. We will then look at certain projects that are uh, all around firmware and bootloaders. And then eventually I will talk about a few success stories that we can present so far, which might be very, very interesting because it's all about shiny and new things that we have achieved over the last few years. So yeah, let's, um, let's just talk about business stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm proposing this here. I'm, I'm saying your bootloader is actually your business. So if you are a business making chips, you're making development boards, then, well, having a bootloader at hand for your customers is very, very important. So before I go too deep into this, um, somebody asked, uh, wait, uh, how did you get a dev board? Uh, what was the process here? Um, there is a dev board program for RS5. Um, I don't have the uh, address uh, right here up front. Uh, just search for it on your favorite search engine. Search for uh, RISC-V dev board program. You will find it. So yeah, um, back to business. So here is now my elevator pitch to everyone making chips or even just developing the software themselves. I'm saying that you know, what customers actually want, what the end users want is something that is fast, that is snappy, that is convenient, and of course secure, right? You might have heard in the recent years that things like ransomware attacks and so on, they were just growing over time and then certain incidents happened. We will also have a brief look at that at some point here. So, you need to worry uh, very wisely choose the components that you put in your firmware that you use as a bootloader, or maybe you stitch together your bootloader of several components. 
But let's actually recap what a bootloader really is. So you remember the title, we're in this limbo between the platform initialization and the operating system. And so we can draw this picture here and I will briefly elaborate what all of these three pieces are, just in a nutshell. So the platform initialization, that is really the very, very first code that needs to be run to bring up a platform. Some people talk about silicon initialization or the SOC initialization. That is usually like filling up a few registers or reading them out. You know, it can be some information that you already present at some point to an end user so that they know on what platform they actually are. But it can also be that you need to like work around certain security issues. For example, you need to set up things in a certain way, like memory protection and things like that. Well, a very important part of that is you need to initialize DRAM. So DRAM or dynamic random access memory, that is the large memory that you get for, so that an operating system such like Linux or Windows or something, you know, they can actually run programs and have them use lots of memory like for editing images or processing video or, well, the Zoom call that we're currently having here, it consumes a lot of memory already. So yeah, this is very, very crucial before even a bootloader can take over. Now the bootloader itself, and well, that is today's topic, right? It needs a certain amount of flexibility. We will also talk about that in a bit. And its main job is actually to fetch the kernel of an operating system. It needs to check for integrity so that you can be sure that the system hasn't been compromised, it hasn't been tampered with. And it might also be that you will need an interactive menu, like for example, people want to play with different operating systems, then they would need an option to switch them, right? So yeah, that is something typically done in a bootloader. It can also be that they have like different revisions of kernels or, you know, things like that. Sometimes they might need different arguments or actually install a system in the first place. Well, speaking of operating systems, there is plenty nowadays of operating systems um, I'm just listing a handful here, which are so-called virtual memory operating systems. So they make uh, use of large amounts of memory. I'm currently ignoring things like uh, real-time systems, for example, Zephyr and so on. They should not be our concern too much today, but we will briefly also talk about why they also in fact may need bootloaders. Anyway, so Linux is something probably most people here will know. It's also something widely used on the RISC-V platforms. Then there is the FreeBSD operating system, an entirely different, but also Unix-like system, which actually came from Berkeley. That's the V in BSD, just like RISC-V also came from Berkeley. Then there is the Plan 9 operating system, which had been a research system in the 90s, but there is still work going on on that today. So I can tell you, we just had the uh, ninth international workshop on Plan 9 this very year, just a few weeks ago. I was there and I could see there is plenty of people working on things, also on RISC-V, of course. Then there is Oberon. You might have uh, heard of uh, one post where somebody actually put Oberon uh, on a very, very small RISC-V processor, uh, which was very funny to see. And then, of course, Haiku, also uh, lesser known, but still... Uh, nice, very uh, interesting operating system that people might want to look into, which also got the first attempts of porting to RISC-V and has already been shown to be running. So with all of that in mind, let's now just really look at the gist of what a bootloader really has to do. Things that you may have seen is what I'm going to show right now. So but first, in just one single sentence, how can we define a bootloader? Well, it is an application in, in a very, very simple sense. It is an application. So it's a binary that you would run on a machine. It loads and it executes another application. So this is like turtles all the way down. This application, of course, can now be another bootloader again, or it can already be an operating system. You know, it can be a very, very long chain. So it is actually still a very generic term. So we will later on also look into 
a sort of classification so you know that we can tell bootloaders apart a bit. Now this one here is something I guess many people have already used. Uh, on the screenshot you see the very famous grub. It's the grand unified bootloader if I remember the term correctly. Um, it is something that is uh, commonly distributed with Linux for example. Uh, it has been used for very many years to actually boot the operating system itself, Linux. And then this was just used for you know, yet another stage. Now, the target application, it can actually be anything. It doesn't have to be Linux. It can also be anything like FreeBSD, for example, is also supported, can be Plan 9. It can also be chain loading into something else again. Some people, for example, also boot into Windows. It's often configurable. That is also a general statement on bootloaders. So they have their own configuration files and formats. They may have their own storage somewhere. You know, so they have customizability. It can be even at runtime, right? So you can change options. You can save those options. Well, the interactive menu is what we are seeing currently on the screen, where you could de uh, just um, decide on what you're going to run next. And well, there is actually a very good example of it. It can actually be any other application again. And the first two are very well known Linux distributions. One is called Debian, the other one is Gen 2. And well, then there is also options to just check memory, the memory test, or it could be just a very tiny application that just reboots the machine again, whatever you want to do. Well, and we actually have a program currently, it's called GSOC, you might've heard of it. It's the Google Summer of Code. And there are many, many projects. One of them is porting Grub to a former project that is called Coreboot for the RISC-V platform. So it has already been ported to RISC-V, but only for UEFI platforms, and we are currently extending that. Now, let's look at if you are a business, what is actually crucial to satisfy your customers when you work on your bootloader? Well, the very, very important thing, of course, is always to watch the demand. You need to know what people actually want. That can be your customers, but it can also be like if you are selling development boards, for example, at scale, you want to look at the feedback that people are giving and they give it in many different sources. Can be like forums, for example. And over time, you know, it might be that the user's requirements actually change. So let's see what we can learn from the very recent past. So one thing is people are looking now for ownership and control. So that means they would actually need to be able to either work on the firmware that they have on their machines already, or be able to just develop their very own firmware, right? So it can be that they actually need to understand how the system really boots, like really starting from the hardware. So they might actually need to throw away your firmware and replace it with their own. They have their own ideas of how to integrate their operating systems. They have their security requirements, especially if you want to sell to large enterprises, it's very, very crucial to them that they can actually control the machine fully. Um, you might have heard about uh, some things that happened just uh, recently, and I will come back to that in a bit. Now, there's rising interest in two projects that I'm also involved in. I might be slightly biased here, uh, but I actually was surprised myself to hear from very different and interesting sources. So one of them is Reddit. You may know it as a very, very large forum in a sense. There is also a RISC-V so-called subreddit, right? So that's like a space where people talk about everything RISC-V. Well, and somebody was uh, posting this year uh, regarding the Milk 5 Pioneer board. I put the link to that comment also here. Uh, and, and the person was asking, hey, why don't they actually collaborate with the Orbit project? So yeah, full disclosure here, I haven't really heard from uh, anyone approaching me regarding Orbit uh, from uh, Milk 5 themselves. Uh, but I recently joined their chat and we might be exchanging. So yeah, they also made a board, which is something that we already um, support in the Orbit project, a different one. And I will be looking into that. Another one is the RV space forum. So that is something I think mostly uh, set up by Star5, maybe also some others. 
Uh, it's where people exchange about their products. And well, somebody also posted the work that I was doing over time for the Vision 5.2 development board. That is something also very recent. I just got mine by the beginning of this year, I think like two and a half months ago or something. And what really surprised me actually, it just happened the other day. So I think it was like Tuesday or Monday, I got an email from an Intel employee actually, and he was asking about Orboot and Linux boot on the RISC-V platform. So yeah, we uh, started exchanging a bit and I got to learn that they just started an entirely new team just to work on the RISC-V platform. And they are writing their firmware or they want to write the firmware in the Rust programming language. I have no further insight at this point, just so that you know, um, there are things going on in very many different places. So yeah, I will um, stay in the loop here and uh, see what we can learn from each other in exchange. Well, and you might have heard that uh, the many hyperscalers that we have now, so there is like Google, Facebook, Meta, and so on, they use projects like Linux Boot, for example, because they need to control their infrastructure, they need to keep boot times very, very low, and Linux Boot gives you that option. We will talk about Linux Boot and Orbit also a bit later on. Now, ByteDance, if you don't know the name of the company, you have definitely heard of TikTok. They are the ones behind TikTok. And as you can imagine, they need a lot of infrastructure. And it just needs to be ready and working all the time. Now, in the wider industry, uh, there is also collaboration going on. For example, among the chip vendors, but they also need to talk to some others like for example, Google might be their customers or it might be anyone else like larger enterprises. So they started different initiatives. There is something, uh, something here called the Platform Runtime Services uh, Group. It's a task group. So um, it's PRSTG. Uh, that is something, well, I also put the link down here. Uh, it's tech-PRS in the uh, RISC-V mailing lists. They're exchanging about how you can supply certain infrastructure for the firmware itself and also for bootloaders. They work on UFI and ACPI, which you may know from the x86 world, you know. And there are big players like Intel. Uh, now there is Ventana and Prevost. They both want to make RISC-V processors. I haven't really seen one of them yet, but, you know, uh, they are working in these groups. Uh, I guess we will see some of their processors over the next years. And then uh, that is also something you might have just seen yesterday because I think uh, the website just uh, uh, was published. Uh, it's called RISE. It's short for RISC-V Software Ecosystem. It is also a collaborative effort of, well, uh, those three vendors up there, but also a few others. Uh, you, you can also uh, look at that website later if you want. Um, and well, this is where uh, currently, you know, all the large vendors are gathering around. I'm currently uh, very curious what this uh, will bring us because uh, they say they want to develop open source software. And well, it might be something that also ends up in MySpace at some point, or maybe I will work with them. Let's see. And in fact, this is also something that the Intel employee that wrote me hinted me toward. Now let's talk a bit about what the actual scope and goals of a bootloader are. So as I already said, there can be many different requirements. They can be quite flexible. So let's actually nail it down a bit to a few certain key features. Well, here is three. There is drivers. A bootloader would typically need drivers. We need parsers and we need loaders. And now what are those? So drivers are something I guess most people have already heard of. It's something, you know, from operating system uh, systems, you know, without a driver, your hardware wouldn't work, right? Uh, like back in the days, for example, sometimes you like bought a printer and you needed to install a driver. It sometimes came with a CD. Today it would be downloaded from the internet at some point, maybe already come with your operating system. So this is really important to talk to the hardware. But why do we need this in bootloaders? Well, the actual system that you want to start with your bootloader is typically in a storage somewhere, or it could be on the network. 
So you would need to have drivers for uh, your SSD, maybe your PCI bus, your gigabit ethernet card, or you know whatever have you on the specific platform. Now, this could be provided by different environments. Um, we talked about Grub. So Grub itself, for example, has a kernel. It's just like an operating system kernel in like just a simpler sense, you know? And then it could also be UFI. They have something which is called Dixie, the driver execution environment, driver in the word itself. It could be Linux. That is what we use in the Linux boot project. More on that later. And it could also be anything else. Yeah, more examples to come. Now we need parsers. So why do we need parsers? Parsers are, well, it is something that understands a format. It reads data and understands the meaning of the data, right? So we need this for configuration files. It can also be that we need to parse input from users. When we have an interactive menu, for example, we need to parse the input, right? So we need to understand commands and things like that interpret them, and then your feedback. Well, in its very essence, it's, it's really just about translating raw data. And this is actually one of the fields which is very, very crucial in terms of security because parsers can easily go wrong. You need to be very, very careful with parsers. Well, eventually we have loaders. Well, what do loaders do? Well, they pick up some certain configuration using a parser, they load an application to memory from a storage that they had a driver for. They may place some additional data in the memory or in some registers. Well, and then they just execute from that memory address that they put everything into, right? I also talked about this before. So yeah, you're welcome to also watch another talk of mine where I talked about the web boot project, which is a special bootloader for a web-based environment. Now, I already told you that security is very crucial. I will not let you go away without a few security remarks here. And so one thing is that we learned just in the very recent past, again, firmware is very well known now to be an attack surface. So the more you put in firmware, the more interfaces you have in firmware, you know, the harder it is to actually nail everything down to something you can still control. Incidents have increased over time. You might have heard of MSI having been compromised just recently. They had some certain key material leak that they were using to sign and secure the software that they put in the flash, which is their firmware, also including bootloaders, right? So you need to take care of that. Um, vulnerabilities in the firmware interfaces themselves, such as the parsers, for example, that read EFI variables on UFI platforms something that is very, very easy to get wrong because it can be any arbitrary data at some point. Something that is called option ROMs that can come from devices themselves that you put in your machine, like on PCI buses. Well, essentially that is arbitrary code. So that also needs to be handled with care. If you just blindly execute it, well, how about somebody sells very, very cheap, let's say network cards, they put some option ROM in there, which is actually malicious. You don't want that in your enterprise infrastructure, right? Well, and then just uh, yesterday came this news um, or the day before, uh, there is something called ACPI WPBT, the Windows Platform Binary Table. Um, that is a way for UEFI-based firmware to load something in, well, a table that is then interpreted by the operating system, loaded and executed, uh, which can be very, very dangerous. So you need to be very careful if you want to use such features. Maybe you don't even want to have those at all to keep your system as secure as can be. Now, the next thing you need to keep in mind is, and this is now also a business thing again, we have very, very large supply chains. So much is involved in designing uh, and making chips, right? So there are these fabs which are, you know, taking a design, they make a chip for it. Now you need to make sure it's actually what you gave them, not something else, right? So there are different projects around this, but there is also the software aspect. So the firmware that you ship that includes your bootloaders and everything, that also needs to be verified to be okay. And there is something people came up with over time, which is called a BOM, a bill of materials. You know, that is uh, like 
essentially ingredients of something and they extended that to software calling it SBOM for software bill of materials. So that is something which is now demanded by, for example, the US government, they came up with an executive order, which is now telling vendors, hey, if you want us to run code that we get from you, you need to supply us with everything that got into that software so that we can make sure it is actually okay for us to run it, not malicious. That was posted just two years ago in 2021. Well, and now it's a business requirement to you. Now, let's classify bootloaders a bit. I already told you there are you know, many, many different options. Um, and I want to give two ways for classification. The first one is whether or not they are interactive. Because if you think about it, well, you could make a non-interactive bootloader, right? It would be very simple. You turn on the machine, it doesn't do anything. You just have your system right away. And that is, for example, the case on the wristbands that, that we have today, or I don't know, kitchen appliances and stuff like that. Nobody needs a menu in a kitchen appliance, right? Well, maybe to select the menu that the machine should make for them, like for cooking, but definitely not for the bootloader, right? So yeah, this is a well, rather simple device in, uh, you know, in terms of bootloaders. But it might be that there are actually still settings necessary or upgrade functionality. And if you have one of these watches, like whatever wristband or something, you may know that usually they come with a counterpart app that you would run on your phone. And then that phone can also change settings on the device. And it can also upgrade firmware in many cases. Well, and all the interactive bootloaders, well, they are also designed for flexible devices. And if you want to run an arbitrary operating system, well, as we already saw, obviously you need some way of choosing. So you need a menu. So you need a rich user interface. It can be something graphical. It could also be technically something textual. You will need to make sure that it fits your customer's requirements eventually. So yeah, as we said, for changing settings and everything, or maybe just enjoying colorful graphics. So it can also be that you need to just tailor something, um, you know, which just you know gives you something, I don't know, fancy bubbles or whatever you want to show when booting up a machine. I also talked about this um, last year, actually, uh, at Fostem. Uh, the link is down here. Well, now we can also classify by application. It is very similar to what I just said. So there are general purpose applications for bootloaders. So it can be that, you know, it is something which, which can do very, very many things, but then you need to choose carefully. Is it actually something you can really customize to your needs? Maybe you need to choose another bootloader, which is already available, you know, so that you can tailor it. It can be very uh, hard at some point, but there are also some options which can be very simple and we will look at one such solution. Now, in the special purpose case, you need actually something. If you are a vendor, you need to provide it. As a developer, you want to use something which you can really adjust as much as you can, as much as you need. Um, Daniel Mangum, uh, also uh, very famous in the RISC-V development space, just posted recently uh, on the ESP32, uh, a very, very famous um, tiny microcontroller that is used for like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi applications, stuff like that. And he explored how you can customize their bootloader even. So before you would actually put your application on there. So now in the second part, let's talk a bit about the different projects that you have and stacks that we can build using firmware and bootloaders. Now, the first part will be about protocols, interfaces, and features. And what I mean by that, well, let's see. There are stages and phases in loading and operating system. So we already talked about this firmware thing that is coming even before the boot loader. Well, and I told you that technically you could chain up lots of loaders just one after another, right? This is what is commonly known as stages, sometimes also called phases. And even in your SOC, you will typically find something which is called a zero stage bootloader, sometimes also just mask rum or boot rum. You know, it is the very first code executed even before the software code. So it's really something you cannot really change. It is really part of the chip. Now, those environments, 
that are booted there, they can already offer you a protocol. So it doesn't have to be that they boot something else right away, but it might be that they offer a protocol for your laptop, for example, so that you can connect the device and then you can talk to it sometimes over UART, like a serial interface or over USB. You know, there are different implementations. So yeah, uh, I just listed two options here, uh, which I found. So all winner, for example, they have something uh, in their chips, uh, the JH7-1XO uh, chips, the ones from Star5 also have a protocol. It's based on X modem. That is also something I used during development already. Well, and now depending on the platform design, it might be necessary, as we said, that you even have multiple stages. Even if you don't want that, it can still be necessary. And for that, of course, you need documentation. So if you are a hardware vendor, please provide that documentation. Document how your boot drum or your mass drum behaves. People need to know this. So otherwise, you know, you will find these questions on the internet like, hey, I need to know how this uh, boot drum here works. Uh, how does it load from different storages? In this case here, it's EMMC. You know, only the vendor can actually tell who made the chip. At the same time, we also need SOC manuals. So SOC systems on chips is the current processors that we designed today. They include peripherals. So we need to know about them. We need to know how the clocks work, how you actually program the machine, what special registers they have, right? So all of that should be included. Usually it comes as a PDF, right? And that is something I would then download when I bought one of your boards. I would want to experiment with it. I need to look at, you know, those documentation parts so that I can actually understand the platform. Now, something which is a bit advanced, which is a very, very nice to have. Some vendors, um, they, you know, give out their so-called SDKs, the software development kits. That is commonly something like tool chains or uh, even prepared code, like can be C code and header files, stuff like that. Then there is something which is called HAL, a hardware abstraction layer. And now there is something very, very nice, which goes even further. It's called SVD. What is SVD? It's a format in the first place. It's based on XML and it describes your hardware essentially just like what you would put in a manual, but it's in a structured form. So it can be processed by a machine. So what that means is you can now have something which a programmer can already take without having to write too much code. So for them, it's a means of cost reduction so that they can efficiently work on their specific use case. There is a programming language called REST, which is very, very famous for their development group, which is the embedded working group. And in the REST embedded group, they actually made a tool which can take these SVD files and create REST code from them. So what they define are you know, these different layers. They have this uh, thing which you see at the very bottom here, which is called a peripheral access crate. That is what the SVD can translate to. And then on top of that, they can build up different abstractions until they have their final application. Now at the very bottom below the line, you see microcontroller, but you can also replace that with SOC in a very generic sense, it can also be applications processors. For example, the all winner D1, somebody actually did that and created a peripheral access crate for the all winner D1 which is very nice. And we also use that in the Orbit project that I'm working on. Now, for development, and especially for flashing uh, your hardware, you would also need certain tools. So during development, you know, it can be that you need to roll over your uh, code all the time. So you need to run it and run it and run it again. So if you have a tool for doing that, that would be perfect. Now, there are a few examples that are listed here where you have tools that talk to bootrom loaders. So like the Sunchi fell tool, for example, or XFEL that is a newer implementation, they can talk to the all winner devices over USB. So you can put them in a certain mode and then you can just load your own code over USB and run it right away. In the same uh, fashion, I did something for the Vision 5.2 board from Star5. I called it VF2 Loader. And then there is also their own implementation, which is a bit different, has its own 
uh, like you know specific use case. Well, and then there are other tools like Snagboot, for example, is a very new tool. It's a collection of you know many of such tools. Now it can also be that you put something like this in a bootloader itself. For example, uBoot has a command which is called SF, the spy flash subcommand, which you can use to just write something from memory to a flash part, or you can read from a flash part and then you know uh, put something somewhere in memory, things like that. And Linux itself also has a driver, it's called MTD, the memory technology device driver that can also be used to read from a flash port or just write to it directly. Now let's come to talk about something that you need to do very early on because before you can even run your bootloader. So, well, the headline says it, you need to initialize the DRAM and the silicon itself. If you don't do that, you can't really meaningfully run the actual bootloader that puts something in memory because if you don't have the DRAM controller up and running, you cannot really use the large memory that you would otherwise have, like the you know many gigabytes we have in DRAM these days. I'm listing four uh, projects here. There is the Core Boot project, for example, which you may already know. It is a project that we actually forked the Orboot project from, so they are related. Uh, in Corbett, we already had RISC-V support very, very early on, I think maybe already eight years ago or something. So yeah, it was uh, one of the very first. Uh, there was a nice summary talk, uh, status report from 2017 that I put in the uh, notes down below. So in Orboot, what did we do? Well, we just forked the Corbett project. We dropped out the C, the letter, but also all the C code and we are writing it in Rust instead. And we actually started with the RISC-V platform right away. And today we are happy to say that we currently support three platforms. So yeah, you can already uh, work with that. Now in UFI, there is also something that is called the SEC phase. That is the very first tiny chunks and then something called PEI or pre-EFI initialization. You can look at something like Project Move, for example, from Microsoft or Tiana Core's EDK2 project. This is where you find reference implementations for UFI. And that is also what many ODMs and OEMs use to you know, customize their own firmware in, uh, in the end. Well, and the famous U-boot, of course, the bootloader that we know. Um, I guess many people who already work with RISC-V and they bought a development board they have seen UBoot at some point. And they have something which is called TPL and something that is called SPL. Those are very, very early bootloader st uh, stages before bootloaders. They're called the tertiary and the secondary program loader. So yeah, um, coming to speak about the different platforms and the ports and flows that we need to consider. So. You know, there are many different platforms. When there is an ISA, such as RISC-V or ARM or what have you, you know, people make many, many different chips based on that. So that is how they define a platform. One example would be, for example, the JH7110, which you find on the Vision 5.2 board. That is a platform by itself. So now if we have a firmware project, and a bootloader, we need to port it to a specific platform so that we can deal with the platform specifics. And we need to come up with a flow so that we can actually, you know, get into an operating system eventually. So this is what has been done so far in UEFI. There's the Tiano Core EDK2 project. It has its stages. I already talked about these first two here, the SEC and the PEI phase. And then they have something which is called Dixie and BDS, the driver execution environment and boot device selection. And they're actually the ones that make up the UEFI bootloader in a sense. Well, from there on, you could run your operating system directly. So that could be a Linux kernel, for example. Um, but they could also be replaced. So essentially, everything that you see here could also be replaced by something like Linux itself, for example. Something we commonly do in the Linux boot project. Well, I already uh, told you about UBoot. UBoot is a very, very rich environment. Also, you find it on many, many embedded development boards, also like um, the Star 5 Vision 5.2 board, for example. So that one supports multiple architectures. So RISC-V, ARM, and many, many others, even x86. 
more than a thousand different boards. They can be SBCs, the single board computers, it can be like, I don't know, your home router, for example, which connects you to the internet, anything you can imagine. Well, and it can directly boot into Linux even, right? So many other payloads are also supported. It can be like FreeBSD, for example, and you could even chain it up with something else like the grub loader, for example, many, many options are available. I don't want to go too much into detail now. So here are two excellent talks, one by Tom Rini. He is currently the main maintainer of U-Boot and the other one by Marek Vasud, or Vasud, I think. Um, they are both very, very active in U-Boot and will occasionally give some updates. And those two are very, very excellent reference talks, even if they are from some years ago. I highly recommend looking at those because they give you a very broad and great understanding of U-Boot itself. Now let's talk about one of my sort of pet peeves in the sense, the Linux boot project. So what we do in the Linux boot project is we say, well, there are already so many implementations of early platform initializations. There's also many different ways uh, to integrate them now. So why don't we just use Linux so that we don't need to duplicate our drivers all the time, right? So imagine you just do the very early initialization of your DRAM and then immediately you hand over to Linux. Makes sense. So yeah, it's a well-known environment. So if you need to uh, deploy this here, you can find lots of engineers who are familiar with it, right? So essentially everyone who just has Linux on their host system installed, they can also just write a Linux application. So it's very, very easy to draft and iterate over bootloaders if you want to have something special for your use case. So yeah, I want to highlight this example here. So this is the plan that I made for porting Orbit to the Vision 5.1 board. That was the one I got here from the DevBoard program in Rex 5. And what I did was, well, I uh, you know, made a sketch. Um, on the left-hand side here is what we got from Star 5 themselves as a reference. So the board itself is starting with the mass drum. As I just explained, that is something commonly found, also called boot drum sometimes. And then they had several components. One was called second boot. Um, that wasn't strictly necessary as it turned out, but yeah, it was sort of there. Uh, it was used for also upgrading, for example, so that you could replace everything else. So it had an interactive menu and it would then otherwise hand over to the DRAM in it. Now from the DRAM in it, they would hand over to a component called Open SBI. If you don't know what SBI itself is, Never mind, it's something that we have in RISC V. I don't want to go into details here though. And then, well, they would hand over to Uboot, one of the projects that we just looked at. So I thought, okay, how can we take this and translate it to the Orboot project where we just write our code in Rust instead? But I took the second boot and started rewriting it in Rust. So this is now what we have in Orboot itself. You can find it in our source code repository. Well. Then I took the DDR init code and also translated that, and I got both into one single part, right? So I don't need to have these two stages anymore. Now, this is actually where I stopped at some point. So I'm currently just reusing the existing OpenSBI environment and the UBIT environment. However, over time, that is what we still need a bit. Um, we're going to have something which is called Rust SBI, another implementation of SBI, and then boot directly into Linux boot. And from there on, we're fully flexible. Yeah, how do we actually do this with Linux? So Linux itself, as you know, is just a kernel, right? So we need environments for it. And there is a project that we created, which is called uroot, the universal root file system. You can essentially also use anything else you want like OpenWRT, for example, I think they use BusyBox most of the time. Um, but yeah, in, in our case, we mostly go with this uh, environment called Uroot. And why is that the case? Well, it's written in a very simple language. It's called Go. It just uses the Linux drivers as any Linux user land would, right? And we can boot from very different sources like local storages, network, and so on. We can embed that into Flash if we want, and we can extend it as we need. So we also have tools, for example, that you can add to 
your Linux boot environment very easily. And I will actually show that in a bit. So yeah, here it's now time for a little demo. And I want to show you something, well, that I prepared here. It's now not running RISC-V, but it's showing you the Linux boot environment. So I will be running something in QMU. It's on a privileged port, so I need to enter some password here. Now this is booting up a virtual machine, which is really just Linux, right? So what does Linux mean? It means we got commands like uname, for example. We can see the kernel, the version that it's running. It's currently 5.15, right? Uh, we can look at, let's say, proc slash uh, the uh, kernel command line, cmd line, right? So yeah, you can see, for example, uh, I'm actually passing an argument here for the frame buffer. So yeah, currently I'm not using the graphical environment for the sake of this demo, uh, but I could as well do that. Now I also prepared something else. Uh, I made a shell script. I just called it Linux boot because that's what it essentially does. Um, it doesn't really do much. It's using a tool that we call CPU, which connects to that machine and then has it run something else. Um, this is now actually coming from my local machine here. So it's a command that is called just boot. I have it here on my machine, but with the CPU tool, I can use anything that I have locally also on my remote target. Well, what happens when I now execute this command, you see this menu here. So this is now the boot menu that we have, which is looking at the various things that you may have on your platform already, like for example, peripherals attached and so on. Well, I just executed it because I didn't enter anything. Um, I just chose the very first option by default. So this is executing Linux itself again. So it's uh, you know sort of the turtles all the way down thing again. And I will briefly show you how it works and what I use for doing so. So I have something here in the directory I call boot. There is this here bootloader entries, and then there is a configuration file. This configuration file is very simple. We just have a title. We have a, you know, some metadata for sorting. Uh, we have something called a machine ID. We have a version. So that is what you see here in the menu, just right next to the title. And well, then I can also pass options again. Uh, the architecture is also in here. Well, and the path to a kernel, and this kernel is just uh, this one here okay, in the boot directory itself, right? So it's in boot VM Linux, you have it right here. And this is then the next kernel that we just execute. And I also did this on the Vision 5.2 development board. I was using a slightly more complex flow, but you know, I was able to then boot from SSD even before Star 5 had upstreamed or started to upstream the driver uh, to U-boot or you know, publish that on GitHub, which was really, really nice. So yeah, when we now uh, look at our proc slash CMD line, well, you can actually say, uh, see this here, there is no the quiet option behind it, right? And well, the EFIFB thing is gone. So yeah, indeed, we just verified this is now a new system, uh, which we're going to shut down because we don't need it anymore. So, yeah, that was the demo. Um, now I want to uh, give you a, a few uh, nice goodies here. So first of all, I want to talk a bit about OS integration, right? So something very, very important when you work on bootloaders, uh, you're making chips, you need to be aware of this. Linux distributions or also other operating system distributions like OpenSUSE, Fedora, Ubuntu, or Debian, for example, they need bootloaders, right? They want to be loaded. Otherwise, they would need to bring their own bootloaders. And well, sometimes they actually do, like the Grub bootloader, for example. So if your bootloader is not flexible enough to boot their system directly, they will just bring it their own. You know, uh, it can also happen that, uh, you know, they just put a full bootloader on SD cards. And that is, in fact, what is currently being done for most RISC-V platforms. However, that would not be necessary. You could as well put something in Flash directly. Right. So for them, it would be best to have something which is standardized. And one example would be the bootloader specification that has already aged a bit. So it's some years old. It came originally from the systemd project. 
and it now made, uh, made its way into the UAPI group. Um, that is a group which is coming from, uh, I think, mostly uh, people working on Linux. And they came up with this idea and saying, hey, this is what we want a bootloader to be, something very, very simple. And that is, in fact, what you just saw in the demo. The configuration file I showed you is a BLS configuration file. So you could already put this in your flash directly. Now, some success stories. Um, I will give you a few case studies here. Uh, the first one is the all winner D1 platform. So that is an SLC that came out like one and a half years ago, I think. So I bought one of the very first boards. I also have one actually right here. Uh, it is very nice. This here is a very tiny one. It's the uh, Lychee D1 Doc Pro. It's a very tiny module and then a breakout board for it. Well, and I ported Orboot to it. That was actually our first full port with Linux boot. So I have all of that in my flash now. So yeah, I will just um, also run it now. We can have a look later if there is still a minute left for it. This system boots within seconds. So we created an environment now, which lets us use the CPU that we have here over the CPU tool that I just showed you actually in the demo. I can just connect it to my laptop and use it as a USB gadget. I don't need anything fancy, just a USB-C cable. So yeah, um, I played around quite a bit with that. I made some demos like, you know, uh, I'm, I've used this tiny screen here, for example. This is actually now another variant of the board, but it doesn't really matter. So yeah, we can do anything with it. So yeah, you, here I was chilling our projects a bit, like the Orboot REST SBI and Linux boot projects. Another thing which I found really, really cool and surprising, uh, Warner Lodge from the FreeBSD community created a bootloader for the Linux boot environment for FreeBSD. And he did that by, well, simply taking their own bootloader, which you know they would actually otherwise run as a separate stage. And he put that in Linux as a Linux command. It is called kboot. And he just recently gave a talk on that at the BSD con uh, CAN conference that is BSD in Canada, uh, just a few weeks ago. So I also encourage you to look into that if you're interested in FreeBSD and modern boot environments. And of course, we can boot any other operating system. So yeah, I uh, also sometimes make these uh, memes. Um, this is the Linux boot logo, right? So if, if you know the serious Rick and Morty, it's uh, often used for a uh, reference. Well. What is Linux's purpose in this sense? Well, I'm saying you can boot Plan 9, right? So Plan 9 being just another operating system again, and Linux boot would happily do that. Now, my, my last point for today will be about cost savings. And actually, that is something uh, which we're already doing uh, because of how we're doing things in projects. One thing is sharing code. So there is something which describes your hardware platform to an operating system, which is called a device tree. So that is a file which can be processed by an operating system, but also by environments such as uBoot itself, for example. And there are device tree files which are being shared between different projects like Linux, uBoot, FreeBSD, well, and even the driver model that is then attaching to this and saying, hey, uh, this is the components of the platform. I need to attach these and these drivers. That model that we have in U-Boot nowadays is actually strongly related to Linux. Well, and now with the modern programming language called REST, there is something which we don't really have for C in that sense. So we have a platform now where we can share code together. And that code sharing is called crate so a crate is essentially like a package or you know a library that you can put in a platform which is crates.io also linked down here below and this is how you can speed up your driver development this is where a vendor for example can put their uh, uh their uh, pack crate that is peripheral access crate the thing you can generate from your svd files right so i can use that right away and write my own driver or you can even make up some certain specific drivers and already share them as crates if you know you just supply the functions that a driver needs to call into. So you already have 90% of what a driver needs to be. Depending on the platform, it may or may not be suitable, but it's a very, very good option these days. 
And speaking of drivers, well, I already told you this, Linux boot makes it possible to write your drivers only once if you want to offer a Linux platform. So if you want to have a bootloader, you can base that on Linux and also have your final operating system based on Linux. So you can use the very, very same drivers. So you can start with your Linux boot kernel in your flash and then execute the final production Linux kernel from your boot source. Uh, there is a question, will there be a session dedicated to bootloaders in embedded systems? And I guess by embedded systems, you mostly mean microcontrollers now, because what I talked about here is uh, mainly application processors. Um, well, I uh, could commit to that right now, um, but I guess we also have uh, many other people who could talk about that. Maybe we could actually uh, invite Daniel Mangum to talk uh, about that here at some point. So yeah, actually, you know, before I was uh, preparing this talk, Rafael and I exchanged a bit and he asked me, hey, uh, why don't you come here and talk about bootloaders and do you have some other recommendations? And I uh, told him somebody who could talk about operating systems. So yeah, bootloaders, definitely talk to Daniel Mangum. Uh, he's uh, very versed in the universe of Zephyr, for example, uh, a real-time operating system. I think that would be a very, very good fit. Anyway, so yeah, to uh, conclude this talk here, um, you know, less effort means lower cost eventually for you and also a faster time to market. If you don't need to replicate a, a driver, you save the time for doing that. And with that, I would like to thank you very, very much for listening. And please ask me any additional questions if you have them. Otherwise, uh, here is already ways to contact me, so you can find me on GitHub, on Twitter, and on Twitch. I actually do live development sessions occasionally. Uh, I started uh, with a regular schedule, but yeah, currently it's more like ad hoc. I put my videos on YouTube. There are archives of how I develop firmware for the RISC-V platforms that we have supported now in Orboot. I also do some other things which might be interesting to you. Well, and eventually the Orboot project itself is on github.com orboot orboot and this very talk here you can find the slides on my website metaspora uh, as a pdf download so we have two more questions Question? yes you want to say something hello go ahead all right so have you found any significant differences porting bootloaders to risk 5 versus arm and x86 so Here's the thing, um, with Linux, we're sort of cheating, right? Because we do not need to develop drivers again and so on. We can just take the code from the vendor right away. So I could use the kernel that I got from Star5, for example, I just cloned that one and then I built it to have my Linux boot environment. And with uroot, because it is written in Go, all I need to do is set an environment variable to build it for a different architecture and that just works. There is only very few occasions where you would need something which is a bit more specific. And that can be, for example, if you need to like, let's say you need to talk to a frame buffer, for example, you need to query for the resolution that can be a bit platform specific. Um, but otherwise with the Linux boot approach, it is really, really easy and simple. Wait, there was a question about uh, a, a presentation for embedded bootloaders. Um, so maybe Daniel can do this talk sometime in the future, but otherwise I'll try to locate someone to, to speak about that. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, any more questions? We have time for, let's say one or two questions. You can raise your hand if you want to ask that uh, the question verbally so we can uh, allow you to talk. Otherwise, you can put the question in the chat. Okay. Looks like we do oh. not have any any other questions, Daniel. So thank I thank you a lot for all the detailed information and all the, the great presentation. So it was really informative. So it's a lot. It contains a lot of pointers for individuals to now explore more in detail what you have talked about so thank you very much for your time thank you for exploring this and explain this to everyone and so folks uh, i'm going to send the presentation and the recording 
uh, maybe later today or tomorrow morning and via member, all members mail at least. So thank you everyone for joining and see you the next technical session. Daniel, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you too. And before we quit this, I would just like to use this opportunity to at least uh, show this uh, one thing that we uh, did, which what? I think might also be very interesting to people. So uh, let me show you now what happens when I say LSUSB. There is now a device which is called Netchip Technology. This is the uh, Linux Ethernet driver, which is running over USB. And this is now how I can talk to my um, device here. Well, I can use it to connect to it. So I can say, let's say uname, for example. Oh, I need to specify the full path here. Um, right. So this is now uh, running on my tiny risk 5 board that I just showed you. Well, uh, what I can also do is I can run my own applications that I have on my host here. And there is a convenience command that I created for that here. So um, this would now build and run this command. Well, it's a, uh, yeah, it's built on a special tool chain in Rust. Okay, never mind. That would now take a little while. Um, we can actually also rewrite this. So this would just execute a binary that I have on my local host here. And then run it over there. Well, um, yeah, I actually made an adjustment. Okay, uh, never mind that right now. Um, I think it should actually work this way. Oh, there we go. So yeah, this is now running on the tiny board that I have here. It's printing its resources. It's a T hat C906 core. That is what you find on the all winner D1. We see the command line here and everything and the kernel and the available memory. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.